Um, when I was younger in law school, I wrote a law review article extremely critical of the ESA. This would have been about the time of TBA v. Hill, uh, one of the early acts, snail darter. Um, over time, I've significantly changed my view um, in that I think we need um, a statement about the preservation of species. Uh, I think it is important that we do it, but it is equally important that we do it in a way that functions properly. The, you know, you read, the, you read the goals and they're very noble and the language is very noble, yet Congress gave an incredibly broad grant of authority which uh, has been sort of used and abused over the period of time by different administrations and by court decisions. So now we have this mechanism that by and large has sand in the gears, I think, in terms of making it work. And it probably, um, as much as a member of the executive branch, it offends me to have to ask for legislative action. Um, I actually believe that, that um, we've got to amend it in a way that protects the original goals but makes it so that it functions. And as you can tell from my testimony, um, I have uh, kind of war stories as long as my arm, uh, but I want to summarize sort of the basic points I think need to be looked at. I think first of all, the listing process has to be disciplined. Uh, one of the reasons that the system doesn't work is it's just too flooded. The gate for getting in is too low. We don't require uh, enough information from somebody filing a petition to invoke the power of the federal government, it not only affects the species, but it affects the rights of a lot of other people, both property rights and personal rights. And that threshold for invoking the power of the federal government should be raised. I don't mean that it should be raised that it becomes prohibitive, but it needs to be more than um, uh, what occurs now. I, I give uh, uh, Mr. Ash credit. They offered some rules um, which were pretty strong, but by the time they were adopted, by their own response in the comments, it essentially said this is the status quo. Um, they, they inserted some things that I think are valuable, you know, one species per petition, um, but they lost a lot of the ground that they had in terms of uh, the nature of the requirements of a petition, uh, in part because a lot of that's not defined in the statute and the case law has been fairly um, fluid. Um, they also uh, abandoned what I thought were some of the best components of the original rewrite of the listing process, which was to empower the states. Because even though um, all wisdom resides in D.C., all knowledge resides in the field. Um, and the local game and fish people, they not only know the biology and the species, but they know the ground. And that gives them a different perspective. Um, and it's not a perspective, as anybody who's been governor can tell you, Game and fish agencies are not stooges for economic development. They are advocates for those interests. You appoint people to those agencies because they believe in that mission, and yet somehow that gets discounted as it works its way through the system and the decision making is centralized in DC. I also think that um, this, um, this vagueness in the statute leads to what I call moving the goalposts. We went through it on wolves, we went through it on grizzly bears, we went through it on sage grouse. I mean, you think everything's done and it's fine, and then here comes um, you know, somebody with a new theory and Fish and Wildlife moves the goalposts. If you can tell from my testimony, we've been at bears forever, we've been at wolves forever. Uh, sage grouse, I will tell you that while they ended up not listing it, by the time they were through integrating it into the federal land plans, we may have been better off with the listing because at least the rules were clear. You knew what you could do under Section 7 and Section 10 of the statute. Um, I'm hopeful that it'll work out, um, but there are, there are days, both when I was governor and since then in private practice, that you wonder whether or not, at least with listing, you had some kind of a, a framework. I also think that you need to rethink uh, warranted but precluded, uh, which has to do with this kind of, I call it uh, wildlife purgatory. You're neither listed nor you're not. So you're just hanging out there. And what happens then, particularly for land, public land states, because remember, public land states are hit most severely by this because of the interaction of NEPA, ESA, and all of the land planning, because everything, nearly everything involves a federal action which triggers uh, the application of the statute. What happens is that the land management agency has essentially become a species management agency by virtue of something called, uh, for Forest Service called species of concern, for uh, BLM, it's called uh, sensitive species, and they, in effect, impose 
listing standards on the management of those species because they're candidate species. Um, the other thing is, is I, I've come to believe um, through, particularly when I was governor, we required mitigation for a couple of really large, uh, significant oil and gas developments where the spacing was such that, I mean, some of that stuff was on five acre spacing. And so that clearly has an impact on the habitat. The mistake we made, um, not that I made many mistakes when I was governor, or at least uh, I made a lot, uh, but um, one of them was, it was that we, we allowed the resource to be dissipated into what I call postage stamp uh, chunks. We didn't think about the species life cycle to make sure it was preserved. So mitigation became kind of watered down. I've become a big believer that mitigation, that is the preservation of the very best of the habitat and the very best of the species on a genetically diverse basis is really important. But it'll only occur if you guys amend this statute to place some kind of discipline in uh, what it's gonna be. And of course, I can't leave as a, um, as a former governor without endorsing the work of the Western Governors Association. Um, remember that that's a group made up of both coastal states and inland states. And uh, it deserves uh, serious consideration as you move forward on bipartisan, particularly on the funding aspect, because uh, there is no free lunch. And ESA is as large an unfunded mandate as you have out there. And we learned that both as governor and then again as a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel, which I reference in my testimony. With that, um, I look forward to the dialogue and the questions.